Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Schuler with Athens Orthopedic Clinic. Uh, today we're going to talk about distal radius fractures. Um, distal radius fractures are one of the most common uh, breaks in the skeleton. It's basically a wrist fracture. Your radius is one of the two bones that runs uh, with the forearm. Uh, your radius is the thumb-sided uh, bone. Distal uh, means away from the head versus proximal, which is towards the head. So a distal radius fracture is a fracture of the wrist uh, that involves the radius, which is one of the forearm bones, uh, at the far end of the bone. So this is a normal x-ray of a normal wrist uh, that does not have a fracture. Uh, this bone uh, right in here is the radius, and what you uh, want to take notice of is, one, uh, the inclination, which is this uh, line right here, uh, you can see it goes away from the uh, elbow, it usually is about a 22 degree uh, angle. Uh, again, noticing that this, these two bones are roughly the same length, one might be slightly longer than the other. So this is the lateral view, which is basically a side view. Uh, the palm is down here, the back of the wrist is up here. And again, in this um, view, we want you to notice this curve right here, which is the joint of the radius. And you can see it's nice and smooth, and it's tilted just a teeny bit towards the palm. So this is an example of a typical uh, distal radius fracture. And what you can see here, again, this is the radius right here. You can see there's pieces off this way. There's a break in the middle of the joint right here, another piece off this way. Uh, and so what we're looking for on this view is does it involve the joint like before, we had talked about that angle of the radius is like typically like this, and you can see that angle is now flattened down. Uh, additionally, you can see there's a little piece of the ulnar styloid, which is broken off here. Uh, just about every time you break the radius, you'll break the little styloid there. That typically does not require any surgical intervention. There is a hunk of cartilage that sits right here that's called your TFCC. Uh, there's another video that actually discusses that, but that's typically broken or torn approximately 85% of the time. Uh, however, uh, we typically do not have to fix those in this, uh, this instance, but it, at some times we do have to manage that. Other things we're looking for, this is your scaphoid. This can also be broken during that time frame. Uh, additionally, these are your carpal bones, and as you notice, these carpal bones are sitting right on top of the bone that's broken. And so one of the things that we always uh, try and ask about and pay attention to is, are you having any numbness or tingling? If you are, that very well could be that you have uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, which ideally, if we need to fix this surgically, we would man manage the uh, carpal tunnel uh, with a carpal tunnel release as well. So this is a side view or, again, a lateral view of a broken uh, distal radius. Things to notice here is, one, that curve that was normally up here and tilted just towards the palm slightly is now tilted towards the back or the back of the wrist. It's all called dorsal angulation or dorsal tilt. Again, when you fall on an outstretched hand like this, you typically get a clean break here and it gets broken into pieces here. That's called comminution, which is one of the things that we look for with regards to whether we need to fix this or not. Uh, again, you can notice this hand is really not even lined up with the forearm at this point because it's been shifted off uh, so much uh, with regards to the uh, broken radius. One more thing to notice with this, your median nerve, which we talked about uh, at risk for carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, goes something like this, and when it's broken and shifted backwards, you can see that nerve uh, would get trapped and actually draped over the top of that broken bone right there, uh, which would ultimately uh, run the risk of carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, like we talked about, you can see that now this radius is actually shorter than the ulna, and part of the problem with that is as this bone heals, it will continue to settle, and when that happens, the hand actually shifts over towards the thumb, and this bone becomes quite prominent if it's not uh, addressed and fixed correctly. So uh, these are x-rays of someone that uh, had a broken wrist that then was fixed uh, with a plate and screws. The typical way to fix these is what's called a distal volar radial plate. Uh, the screws lock into the plate. We'll sh have an example of that in just a minute. Uh, but you can see this is that plate. It's nicely lined up. It's actually designed to sp uh, fit specifically on the radius. There's a uh, nice alignment of the joint. There's no step-offs or gaps. You can also see the screws that are all within the bone. Uh, none of them penetrate the joint here, uh, allowing the bone to heal, as well allowing for range of motion of the wrist without limitations.
Again, this is a lateral view or a side view. Um, again, the palm is here, the top of the wrist is here. You can see this is the plate and it's perfectly lined up uh, along the, uh, the volar uh, aspect of the uh, distal radius. You can see the screws are not uh, too long. These screws actually look like they're even a little bit short. Uh, if you notice, um, the, the, it doesn't go quite to the bone. The purpose behind that is this part of the bone is actually a bit rounded, and if all the screws go up to it, that would mean the screws would be a bit uh, too long um, on the, the sides. So really, everything's perfectly lined up. You can see the curve of the joint is now tilted again just towards the uh, palmer side. You can see the hand is perfectly lined up with the forearm. And so really, uh, this is a, a nice example of a, a well-placed plate and screws with uh, a well-heeled fracture afterwards. Uh, this one screw does look like it's in the joint. Um, if you look back at the AP view, Right here, uh, you can see this screw is the screw that we were looking at that looks like it's in the joint when you look across this way, but you can see it's obviously not in the joint uh, right there. So uh, distal radius fractures, the most common uh, story is someone that's uh, falling on an outstretched hand. Uh, when they do that, uh, they break the wrist and it usually is bent backwards. Uh, there is something called a volar Barton's fracture where typically you fall and land like that and the bone is bent uh, towards the palm. Uh, the things that we worry about are, again, distal radius fractures or scaphoid fractures can also be something that can be broken uh, with this type of injury. Uh, the alternative uh, in the younger population, uh, typically when they break their wrist, uh, it's more of a high energy type of uh, injury such as a car accident, uh, falling from a height or something like that. Uh, the other uh, high uh, risk population is uh, typically uh, ladies um, uh, over 50 to 60 that might have uh, some early menopause, uh, menopause and or uh, osteoporosis that might result in some soft bones uh, that then typically a ground level fall can result in a distal radius fracture. So if you've broken your wrist, uh, the question is how do you treat it? Uh, the main thing to understand is the bone likely will heal regardless of what's done with regards to uh, management of that fracture. Uh, the real question is how is the uh, bone gonna heal? Will it heal in the correct alignment? Uh, will you have problems afterwards uh, if it doesn't heal correctly? So the first option is obviously non-operative treatment. Um, that typically is uh, a fracture that is uh, not something that's terribly displaced, it's not in the joint, uh, or uh, potentially if the patient's uh, either too sick uh, to be operated on or just chooses not to operate. Um, with the splinting, we typically try and involve uh, the wrist as well as the elbow when we splint uh, these patients. Um, we typically put what's called a splint or a sugar tong splint on uh, that's not circumferential. Uh, the purpose behind that initially is to still allow for healing, or I'm sorry, swelling. Uh, if there's too much swelling and we've wrapped uh, the arm up in a circumferential cast, you can cut off the blood supply and have problems with that. So typically, uh, the initial cast or splint is uh, something that starts at the palm, wraps around the elbow, and goes back over the top of the wrist. Uh, this purposefully immobilizes the elbow, uh, and the reason behind that is we want to prevent twisting of the wrist because that can obviously allow for uh, those uh, bone pieces to shift, uh, and so the only way to prevent twisting of the wrist is include the elbow. So typically after about two weeks in that uh, what you might call long arm cast or one that goes around the elbow, uh, we transition you into a, a short arm cast that allows you to uh, start to move your elbow again. Uh, the elbow gets very stiff after uh, fairly short amounts of time with regards to immobilization. So we want to get the elbow moving uh, but still maintain good position and good alignment of the break. Uh, we are relying on the cast uh, to hold the bone in position. Uh, so that's part of why uh, typically if we perform non-operative management, you're in a cast for typically about six weeks, uh, followed by some um, uh, additional uh, immobilization or removable splints after that. Uh, in an adult, uh, normally bones can heal uh, roughly by about eight to ten weeks um, to allow for uh, fairly normal daily activities. So assuming uh, you've broken your wrist uh, and we're thinking about surgery, there's several things that we look at that uh, help us to try and make that decision of do you or do you not need surgery. Uh, of those are, uh, is the break uh, within the joint? Uh, is the joint displaced? And that means either split or uh, displaced with regards to uh, a depression. Uh, do you, have you lost radial height or inclination? Uh, is the radius shorter than the ulna? 
Uh, do you have uh, what we call comminution or uh, a lot of bits and pieces that are broken up that would not uh, be very stable over the time period? Um, additionally, we're looking for things um, such as the volar tilt. Uh, typically, again, the, uh, the joint point points towards the palm at about 10 degrees of angulation. Uh, once you get to neutral or starting to uh, tilt back towards the back of the wrist, uh, those are all uh, things that typically uh, help us to uh, lean towards surgical intervention. So other things that we might consider with regards to surgery versus non-surgery, uh, if you do have uh, signs and symptoms of carpal tunnel with the hand uh, being numb, again, that would be another indication uh, to consider uh, proceeding with surgical intervention. Uh, one of the risk factors for something called complex regional pain syndrome or sympathetic dystrophy, uh, anytime we have a name or two names for something uh, and we don't, and they're really long, we typically don't know what we're talking about. But in this case, uh, it's a uh, nerve compression or a loss of function with the sympathetic nervous system that results in uh, pain, swelling, uh, and in increased stiffness. And that can be a, a cause due to carpal tunnel syndrome. So we try and be lean towards the side of making sure we release any pressure on the nerve uh, to avoid one of those uh, pretty bad complications that we're not 100% sure exactly what's going on with. So assuming uh, you've broken your wrist and uh, it's bad enough that we think uh, you need surgical intervention, uh, there's two real main options. Uh, one is what's called closed reduction and percutaneous pinning. Uh, that's typically where we will uh, knock you out. Uh, you won't be awake for it. Uh, we uh, pull on the bone, try and get it lined up correctly uh, without uh, making any incisions, uh, and then use some pins that we drill through the bone uh, to hold the bones in place. Uh, it sounds pretty gruesome, but it's, it's really not uh, as bad as it sounds. Uh, and again, uh, it's not something that you would be awake for. Uh, typically, uh, these are for the less uh, severe breaks uh, and typically ones that are uh, not uh, involving the joint. Um, additionally, uh, once you reach the age of about 50 or 55, uh, especially in females, uh, the concern is the bone might not be strong enough to hold the pins and the uh, pins might cut through the bone. And so typically once uh, you reach the age of 50, we're thinking more along the lines of a plate and screws as opposed to just pins. So assuming you've um, been treated, you had pins placed in your wrist, these pins typically uh, stay in for approximately uh, four to five weeks. Uh, again, depending on the break itself, the stability of it, as well as uh, factors such as age. Um, but uh, once uh, they uh, are ready to come out, uh, these are usually pulled in the office. Uh, it sounds bad. We've done it on four-year-olds without uh, any problems. Uh, we basically just uh, grab hold of the pins and twist. As we twist, uh, we uh, place gentle traction on those pins. They uh, slide out about a millimeter every time you twist it. Uh, while it sounds scary, it's really uh, not something to be terribly worried about. So uh, if you've broken your wrist, if it's uh, bad enough that uh, we think it needs surgery, and if it's in uh, basically multiple pieces or uh, a fairly unstable uh, fracture pattern, then we're typically going to talk about performing an open reduction internal fixation. Uh, what that involves, again, typically is an incision in the palmar aspect of the hand right here, uh, where we would go in uh, and reduce the bones so that they're perfectly lined up or as perfect as we can get them, uh, and then place uh, a plate and screws in there that will hold everything in place. Uh, one of the benefits of either pins or plates and screws is it allows us to mobilize the hand and wrist uh, at a faster rate. Uh, we typically uh, will put someone in a similar what we call sugar tong splint that again goes from the palm around the elbow to the back of the wrist uh, for approximately two weeks after which uh, they're uh, transitioned to a removable brace. And so while uh, surgery is not always fun, uh, it does allow typically for earlier mo mobilization and potentially uh, earlier uh, range of motion type activities. So this is typically a plate that we would use. Um, you can see we'd make an incision right here in the palm. We'd place the plate uh, on top of the bones once they've been reduced and well aligned. And then we put uh, these screws in here that hold the uh, plate or the bone in position. Uh, one of the nice things and unique things about this plate, and there's many uh, options, are these screws actually lock into the plate. The screws are threaded, and so they become what we call a fixed angle, which is a very uh, stable construct that allows us to both uh, grab and stabilize uh, small pieces of bone as well as softer bone.
So assuming you've broken your wrist, assuming you had surgery, um, then again, like we said, we typically immobilize for about two weeks, after which uh, we get it moving. Uh, what you'll notice is as you start to move that wrist, it will become red, sore, stiff, swollen. Uh, and really most people are, are terribly concerned that they've uh, either shifted something uh, or broken something uh, again. And certainly that's possible, but typically uh, anytime you start to begin to use your uh, wrist again, begin to do more activities as you start to feel better, you'll tear scar tissue. That scar tissue will uh, bleed and cause a redness and swelling. That typically goes away after a day or two, and so uh, it's not something to be terribly worried about. I tell people it's similar to exercising. Uh, if you go exercise, uh, you're not worried. If you're sore afterwards, you feel like you've done a good job of exercising. In the same way, as you start to get your motion back, start to get your function back, you'll have very similar uh, redness, swelling that uh, is not uncommon. Uh, it can last up to even several months, uh, depending on how bad the injury was. I typically tell people uh, after they've broken their wrist, this is about a three to six month recovery, uh, which is a certainly a long time. Uh, my hope and expectation is whether it's uh, performed surgery or not, uh, you're able to get pretty close to full range of motion and pretty close to normal function afterwards. Uh, again, depending on the injury that can or cannot be uh, expected, uh, and we can talk more about those uh, expectations both uh, before or after the uh, surgery or intervention. Uh, ultimately, uh, my expectation and my goal is to have it where you need to be looking at the wrist to see which wrist has the incision uh, as to figuring out and remembering which side was actually broken. So that's about it for distal radius fractures. Uh, hopefully this has been helpful in understanding a little bit about what's going on, what to expect, and uh, if there's any questions, please feel free to let us know.